Welcome, and thank you for joining today's webinar. Before we begin, please ensure you have opened the chat panel by using the associated icon located at the bottom of your screen. If you require technical assistance, please send the chat to the event producer. Throughout the presentation, you will be able to submit written questions. Please address your questions to all panelists from the drop-down menu in the chat panel and enter your questions in the message box provided. All audio lines will be muted for the duration of the call. And with that, I will turn the call over to Liz Fernandez. Please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. I'm Liz Fernandez with the Professional Development Services Branch, and I would also like to welcome you to today's webinar. Our speaker today is Dr. Alicia Marston. Dr. Marston is the Aquaculture Trade Specialist for USDA APHIS Veterinary Services. She works in both the live animal import and live animal export team stationed in Riverdale and has been with USDA APHIS Vet Services for five years. Prior to her current position, she served as a field VMO in Maine and an export VMO in New York. Dr. Marston received her bachelor's in marine science from the University of Maine and her DVM specializing in aquatic animal medicine from Atlantic Veterinary College at the University of Prince Edward Island in Canada. She has experience practicing aquaculture medicine in all major fish, crustacean, and mollusk commodities throughout the United States, Canada, Thailand, and Norway, and enjoys promoting aquaculture domestically and internationally through her additional roles as co-chair of the VF Aquaculture Business Plan and National Strategic Planning Efforts. And with that, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Dr. Marston. Great. Thank you, Liz. Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's webinar. We're going to uh, talk about international movement of aquatic animals. And um, so to start off, we will uh, go through just, you know, how a little bit of a background on how animals move internationally. Um, and then also aquatic animal oversight. Um, is we have a unique setup here in the United States where there's multiple federal agencies that have some oversight over aquatic animals. So we'll go through those in more detail. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about exporting animals. So what are the regulations? Where do you find them? Um, and some other things to think about when you're exporting aquatic animals, and then also, conversely, as those animals are coming into the country, what sort of um, regulations do we have and requirements uh, and considerations. And towards the end, we'll talk about just the, the overall transport of live aquatic animals um, and how we ensure safe animal transport. So to get started, the international movement of aquatic animals. So um, in general, export, when I refer to export requirements, we're talking about these are live animals that are leaving the United States and they're going to um, another destination, they're going to a destination country. Um, when we're talking about imports, we're talking about animals that are entering the United States. Um, and when I say animals, um, that would include live um, you know, fish or crustaceans or mollusks, but also um, their germplasm. So um, it could be fertilized eggs, milk, um, you know, smaller um, seeds, life stages, um, the, whole, the whole gamut. So we're talking about all of those kinds of groups of aquatic animals. In general, um, the movement patterns of different groups of aquatic animals will vary by the species that we're talking about and the end use. And you know, my colleagues uh, in the past presentations have talked a lot about how there are you know really some unique characteristics to um, you know fish versus crustacean versus mollusk aquaculture. Um, and we, we lump it all together under the aquaculture umbrella, but, but there really can be, um, you know, some, some stark differences in why we move animals um, and the end uses. So um, the, the common ones I have listed here are for breeding. So um, we're sending either broodstock or germplasm um, to another country where they're going to be used in their breeding programs there. Um, for grow out, so um, we're sending these animals to another country where they're going to go into an aquaculture setting and be raised up. 
um, for their end use. So, so kind of similar to, you know, like a feeder cattle sort of situation where um, we're sending a younger animal that's going to go to another country and they're there to, to grow. Um, you know, we have human consumption, so we have animals that go both live or dead. Um, directly to another country for, for them to be eaten. We have um, research animals that move around the world, um, especially, you know, zebrafish is one of the most common um, types of research uh, species used, but there's a lot of others um, that were mentioned by my colleagues as well um, during their presentations earlier. Then we move animals for the aquarium and pet trade. Um, we use uh, we use aquatic animals for bait and feed, whether it's for other species or aquatic species. Um, it, it you know both of those categories um, you know for pet food or you know maybe maybe an aquatic species going for feed for another aquatic species. So and then stocking and enhancement, and that would be you know stocking rivers and lakes um, for. Uh, more of our, what we kind of think of as natural resources um, areas. So when we think about fish, now what I tried to do here is to highlight the areas that I see the most on the import-export side um, for international movement. So for fish, we, we move a lot of either brood stock or even more commonly um, fertilized eggs for breeding. We, um, we both import those and we export them. Um, same when, it, you know, for human consumption. We, we bring in a lot of fish um, for our own consumption. And we also raise animals up that we export uh, for human consumption in other countries. For import, we also bring in a fair number of um, species for the aquarium and the pet trade. And we also export uh, aquarium and pet trade animals. Um, and then we, we, like I mentioned, also for research, uh, we export a lot of species for research, including zebrafish, um, fathead minnows, um, and other, you know, other, you, just like we have specialized uh, species models for rodents, we have that for fish as well. When we look at the crustacean markets, um, we, there are some crustacean producers that will bring in animals for breeding. They want to diversify their genetic stock. And then we bring in animals direct for human consumption. Um, we talked about earlier during this webinar series how with shrimp, shrimp aquaculture, we raise up a lot of the genetic stock here, and then we, then we export those animals for grow out in other countries and then buy back the, the finished product uh, for human consumption here. So, so the big categories that I most routinely see for imports are we bring animals in for breeding or human consumption. And then for export, again, breeding and human consumption, but also sending those genetics out for, for grow out as well. For mollusks, um, it seems to, we do probably the highest volume is going to be for human consumption, both um, bringing animals in and um, sending them out, but we also export a fair amount of animals for breeding purposes. So within the United States, as I mentioned, we have a couple of agencies that oversee aquatic animals. Um, and I, the, um, my goal of this section is to kind of give you a snapshot of what each of these agencies do and sort of the, the key areas that they cover. Um, but with the understanding that, you know, all four of these, all four of these groups, these agencies work together. And there's definitely, we always encounter some gray areas where we need, you know, it doesn't quite fall into one of our, you know, one of our buckets and we have to work together. Um, or, you know, we have, signed um, agreements that we will work on each other's behalf in certain circumstances. So there's a lot of collaboration, and this is an area that, um, you know, we, we is a challenge um, for our country because there's so many cooks in the kitchen, but at the same time is, 
you know, an area that we are continually working to improve our communication and collaboration across all of these groups. So the first group is the is NOAA, uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. They are under the U.S. Department of Commerce. The second group is the Fish and Wildlife Service. They are under the U.S. Department of the Interior. Then we have APHIS, so Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service with the U.S. Department of Agriculture, that's our group, and then Food and Drug Administration, which is under the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So we'll go through these one by one. So for NOAA, um, they primarily oversee human consumption animals that are being exported. So, um, you know, a fisherman goes out to, um, to to, to catch a certain type of fish, they come into port, and then they're exported for human consumption. Um, NOAA would be the main um, point of contact for those, those exports. The animals could be wild or farmed, so it could be wild-caught um, animals that are out in the, the ocean, um, or it could also be farmed, which is what we're seeing more um, with the development of the offshore aquaculture in uh, the exclusive economic zone that's upcoming. So either one, but, but principally NOAA oversees anything that's marine, so saltwater species. Um, so I think saltwater and human consumption, what I'm trying to kind of have some key, key terms to keep them all straight in my head. Now when we look at Fish and Wildlife Service, they are not involved in human consumption. Um, primarily, they're looking at wild species that are in fresh water. Um, so, and they have both import and export um, regulations for, for those species. So, um, you know, like I said, there's a, there are exceptions, but those are the, that's kind of the, the bigger category for fish and wildlife. So wild species and fresh water. Then for APHIS, um, we're the Department of Agriculture. So we do farm species um, primarily, and we do the import and export of both the marine species and the fresh water that are raised on aquaculture farms primarily. And most of the time, they're not going for human consumption because our purview is animal health. Um, so we are looking at um, animals that are being moved that require some sort of oversight um, and attestation of their health status. Um, and we, um, yeah, and, and then the next group is FDA. So FDA is all about human consumption. They can be either marine or freshwater species, wild or farmed, uh, but primarily they oversee the import of those animals into our country. Um, or those, you know, those animal products into our country. So human consumption import is sort of the big bucket for FDA. Now, when we're looking at exporting animals from the United States, um, we're just talking about USDA here, um, USDA APHIS. So how do we know what animals are regulated for export um, internationally? So when we talk about export, it's really all about where are those animals going. Um, it, you know, it's similar when we're looking at interstate movement, it's where the animals are going, but especially for international. So we have very few APHIS regulations on what, an, what a certain farm or species um, or population may need to meet in order to export. It's, from a USDA perspective. It's all about where are they going and what are the requirements they need to meet before they can go there. Um, so it's set by both, it's set by the destination country and it can be, um, we have some countries where they have one set of requirements that basically applies to anything that's in water. Um, and then we have other countries that are very specific. They break it down into crustaceans versus mollusks versus tropical fish versus tilapia. Um, so it really can vary, um, and, and, uh, but those requirements are for those species to that particular country. So how do you go about finding 
out where these requirements are located. Um, the best place and the first place to go is to our webpage. So we call this the IREGS, the International Regulations page for animal export. Um, and on this page, there are two areas I want to point out to you. The first one is down um, about midway down the page, there's a live animal export resources page. Um, that is new uh, as of the last two weeks or so and has a lot of information that pertains to um, live animal exports in general. But then there's also a special section for aquatic animal exports. And so it goes, uh, there's information on disease testing and laboratories um, and a variety of other resources that apply to more than one country. Um, and the, the registration program that I'll mention in a little bit are all, all there. So this, this is sort of the, the general location for information in general about exports including aquatic animal export. Then the other resource that you get to from this page is further down, and this is a drop-down menu where you select the country that you want to go to. Again, exports are dependent on the country you want to go to. So let's, um, for example, select Costa Rica and see what requirements we have for Costa Rica. So we select Costa Rica from the drop-down menu, and it takes us to Costa Rica's page. Um, here's where you're going to find all of the requirements that Costa Rica has to send any kind of animal. So whether it's a bovine, equine, um, you know, sheep, um, aquatic animals, zoo animals, anything that we have requirements negotiated with Costa Rica on um, will be on this page. So as you scroll down, the first thing you'll see is, um, and you'll see this on every country page, there's a colorful box or banner. Um, we call this the VHIC banner, and um, it will typically be um, green or orange or purple. Those are the most common colors, and they mean different things. So basically what they mean, this one is green for Costa Rica, and that's because um, under in the table under save time and money, it will say um, for every health certificate that's traveling internationally, it needs to be signed by a USDA accredited veterinarian, and then it needs to be countersigned by a USDA APHIS uh, VMO. So this, tab this table tells you whether or not the country that the animals are going to accepts electronic signature. So in the case of Costa Rica, they will accept an electronic signature from the accredited vet as well as an ele a digital endorsement um, from the USDA APHIS VMO. And then there's a whole host of additional resources down below to help you um, work through all of the, the various steps electronically to be able to submit health certificates. And we'll go into VHICS a little bit more in just a moment. Then later down, further down on Costa Rica's page, there is, is there's a section specifically for aquatic animals. And there's a couple of things I want to point out here. So um, for those of you that have not been on this page, on a country page on the IREGS, um, either recently or ever, there's typically a couple of things that you want to look for. So the first thing under the aquatic animals heading is you'll see that there is um, a statement about the uh, registered aquaculture export facility. Um, approval and whether or not that's required for this country. This is something fairly new that we've added in the past year where um, we have some health certificates or negotiated um, protocol that the destination country requires that the facility has been inspected and approved by APHIS. So a, a note has been added to um, any of the country pages where this is a requirement to make it very clear because it's not always incredibly clear um, on the health certificate itself. Sometimes it's in, you know, it's written in, in government language. Some, sometimes it's not the best translation because it's a bilingual certificate. There's a variety of reasons. Um, but if you see this uh, wording at the very top there, then you know that in the case of for Costa Rica, registrations required for both the tilapia and ornamental health certificates. 
Then the next thing down you'll see are the health certificates themselves for tilapia and for ornamental aquatic animals. So that's what you will need to click on to find out, um, you know, all of the information that needs to be put together and signed off on in order to send animals to that country. And in this case, Costa Rica has specific requirements for tilapia and specific ones for ornamentals. Then you may also see under the ornamentals, um, you may see something similar to this on other pages where there's a note or there may be um, instructions. These are usually, uh, it's important to pay attention to these because these usually will provide more information and more detail. In the case of ornamentals to Costa Rica, they have a list of species that you're prohibited to um, send to their country. Uh, there may be, we have for some countries, there's instructions on how to complete the health certificate or um, on how to do the testing uh, that's required prior to export. So you always want to look at those additional resources that will all be in um, this section under aquatic animals for this page. So once you've reviewed all this information um, and you think, okay, um, you know, I'm getting ready to send a shipment of tilapia to Costa Rica, but who do I contact with questions? Um, we have recently undergone, or within the past two years, undergone um, a re reorganization. Um, and so I wanted to point out our, our major centers within the U.S. where the, all they do um, our export health certificates. So this is their bread and butter, this is their expertise, um, and they are going to be excellent resources for you to reach out to um, for your particular questions. There are some areas within the U.S., depending on where you are, where there may be um, a different office that you typically send your health certificates to, um, and, and, and that's fine as well. I just wanted to point out our, our four um, big service centers um, that can be of assistance. So we have one on the West Coast in Sacramento, one centrally in Madison, Wisconsin, and then one up in the Northeast in Albany, New York, and then one down in Florida in Gainesville. So what are some of the additional considerations? Um, I'm not going to go into these in too much detail, um, but I do have additional resources uh, if you have any questions or, or would, would like more information, um, just let me know. But in general, uh, we mentioned that some, some countries require facilities to be registered, so that they have been um, inspected and approved by APHIS. And um, in, case you're, in case you weren't aware, we recently had an update to our registration program. So, um, the registration program has been around since early, mid 2000s. Um, and we've kind of updated some of our documentation and processes just to improve the process and to better document what we're inspecting um, and to make sure that we're meeting our trading partner requirements um, accurately. So you always want to look and see if that might be something that you need to do prior to sending a shipment to a certain country um, because that can take a couple of months to, to get everything together and have an APHIS BMO come out to inspect your facility, et cetera. Another thing that I wanted to mention is disease testing. Um, disease testing can be incredibly confusing sometimes, especially if you're working with a facility that's sending, you know, multiple different species to multiple different countries. It can really vary on what you need to actually be seeing on that lab report. So the pathogens that need to be tested for may differ. The sample size that you need to use um, to be able to say that your, that your, you know, cohort of animals or the premises the population on the premises are free from a certain disease. Um, the test methods may be different. Um, some countries may require you to use a PCR test, whereas others prefer virus isolation. Um, and then the laboratory may, may differ. So this is something that um, we 
we here at APHIS, we recognize that this is a challenge and we're working to, to improve um, this whole process. But in the meantime, we have a variety of resources to help um, explain exactly what test type and what laboratory type need to be used when. Um, and that can be found on our IRIC page as well. And the last thing I wanted to mention for exports is our health certificate, certificate submission. So I mentioned VHIC, our Veterinary Export Health Certification System. Um, fortunately, due to uh, one of the fortunate things from the current pandemic is that all countries have now moved towards allowing some use of the VHIC system for export um, of live animals, and that includes aquatic animals. So uh, all of the certificates that we have can be um, digitally signed by the accredited veterinarian and uploaded into VHIC, and then it will depend on the country whether or not they will allow um, USDA APHIS veterinarian to endorse digitally or whether we'll need to print the certificate out and sign it. This has changed some of the dynamic of how we do certificates here in the U.S. because now that it's more in this electronic platform, we have offices that are um, signing health certificates. You know, New York may be signing health certificates for folks that are sending animals out of Arizona. Um, and so it, it has, um, I think that, you know, it has created some some new learning hurdles for us, but I think ultimately it will create more consistency in how we sign health certificates um, across across the country. And you know, we want to make sure that the uh, the shrimp producer in California is being held to the same standards to send to the same you know to the same country as one in Hawaii, as one in Florida, um, as one in Minnesota. So. The, um, the VHIC system is not perfect um, and definitely, um, you know, is a continual ongoing um, area of improvement, but um, is also giving us a lot more flexibility uh, given the, the current pandemic. So what about importing animals into the United States? So when we talk about import, um, the regulations are a little bit different. So USDA bases our import regulations and the species that are regulated based on diseases of concern. So the, the diseases of concern that we have are spring viridia carp and tilapia lake virus. Um, these are the two pathogens that we currently have import regulations for. And um, the import regulations apply to the susceptible species that USDA considers susceptible to these pathogens. So that can sometimes be confusing because especially with, with SBC, um, there might be some countries that can consider uh, one species susceptible to SBC but another doesn't. So we have a very defined list of what species USDA considers susceptible to SBC, to TILD, and any import any live animal imports or germplasm um, from those species are required to meet our import regulations. So where do we find this information? The, again, the best place to go is our website. And so we have an import page for live animals. Um, and then there's a series of blue boxes down um, below. And you click on the one for fish, fertilized eggs, and gametes. There you're going to find all of the um, species that are regulated, the basic requirements to bring animals in, um, as well as some additional information. So every live aquatic animal shipment must have three things. They must have a USDA import permit. They must come with a health certificate uh, that was issued by the veterinarian in the exporting country. Um, which may include negative test results, and they must have a USDA veterinary inspection upon arrival um, at the U.S. port of entry. So wherever they are entering the United States from, they must have a USDA 
veterinary inspection to look at those animals. Um, if in some cases, especially with, um, with live fish, and we have limited designated ports where those animals can come in through. So we don't allow them to come through any port because we want to make sure that we have appropriate staffing. Um, and any shipments that are found to be non-compliant, so not meeting one of these you know, three areas, um, will be refused entry into the United States. That is under um, our purview, and so then there's typically two options. The, the importer can choose to return those animals to the country that they came from, or they're euthanized um, at the importer's expense at the port. So that is one of, you know, we are not just letting any shipment come in. They must meet these requirements. We work with the importers um, to make sure that they understand these requirements and, um, you know, if there are any issues, we, we work to bring them into compliance. Um, but ultimately, if at the end of the day they can't meet our import requirements, we're not going to jeopardize the animals that are already here within our country um, with animals of, of unknown or, um, you know, positive health status that could affect the rest of the animals um, domestically. So for the USDA import permit, these are issued electronically, um, and you need to have a permit application and a permit per shipment, and there's a permit fee of $150, and the permits are valid for 30 days. So um, you typically enter the, uh, the estimated date of arrival for the shipment, and then you have that permit is valid for 30 days from there. So there is some flexibility. Um, if, you know, the flight gets canceled or what have you, and we also work with importers to uh, amend permits as needed. But there's, the permit is specific for that shipment. As I mentioned, the health certificate is issued by the, a veterinarian in the exporting country, so the country that the animals are leaving from. And um, it will, you know, the exact testing requirements will depend on the pathogen of concern, but but in some shape or form, they need to have um, be negative for the, the pathogen of concern, whether it's SBC or TILD. And then inspection um, inspected by USDA when they arrive at the U.S. port of entry, uh, they need to the importer needs to contact that port within 72 hours to arrange the inspection to make sure that we have someone there to meet the flight. Um, and then also, you know, as I mentioned, there's certain ports where we can ensure that we will always, you know, have staffing available to accommodate shipments, um, whereas we have other ports in the U.S. where we do have live animals that will come into those ports, but it's, um, we may have a field veterinarian that covers that port because um, just for the, the every once in a while shipments that may come in, uh, maybe there'll be a hatching egg or a germplasm that will come in. Um, through that particular port, and so we arrange those on a on a case by case basis. And there's an inspection fee of $132 an hour um, for us to look at the the animals when they come in. Um, when the animals, we'll talk a little bit about packaging in a few minutes. But when the animals come in, they're packaged up um, in plastic bags and. So we don't open that bag. It's a little bit different than how we do um, inspections for other live animals coming in where, you know, a, a, a cow we would be looking at, you know, scratching for ticks and looking at various things and be able to potentially touch the animal um, or, or touch the horse. Um, with fish, we keep them within that enclosed bag because essentially once that bag is opened, then um, we don't have any control over um, what any diseases that could spread from those animals or that water. So we want to make sure that we feel um, confident that there's uh, no risk of disease introduction before we open up those packages. So the inspection is done through the plastic bag. Um, you know, if you can picture like a, a plastic bag you get at the pet store with a goldfish in it. Um, you know, you're picking it up, you're looking at them, you're looking for any growth um, signs of SVC or TILD. It can sometimes be difficult 
Um, sometimes the fish are um, slightly sedated for for the trip, or maybe they've been traveling for a long time and and they're you know kind of they're running out of oxygen and they're you know they don't look that great. Um, sometimes we get high mortalities. Um, we we have a threshold of five percent mortality for shipping internationally into the U.S. And if we have greater than 5%, then we look into that further and we want to make sure that um, that we're finding out the cause of that high mortality. Um, sometimes it can be issues with transport. Um, they're, you know, they transport through Anchorage, Alaska, and they get left out on the tarmac and they get too cold. or um, they get too hot or, um, you know, they, they lose some water or there wasn't, you know, they weren't packaged correctly. There are a whole host of things that can go wrong um, with transporting those animals. And so we want to be looking for, for all of those kinds of things um, during the inspection and doing our best to make sure that those animals are healthy. As well as looking at the documentation that should support their health status um, coming from the, from the exporting country. So if you have questions about imports, the best place to go um, would be the ports themselves. Um, I know this is kind of a busy map, but basically, um, you know, all of the primarily our, our live aquatic animals come in through our airports. Um, we do have some come through um, our northern border with Canada. Um, and our southern border with Mexico, but I would say the majority come in through our airports and usually our major airports. So, um, you know, we have Hawaii, LAX, uh, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, um, New York, uh, Miami, Atlanta, Houston, um, those are Chicago, those are a lot of the, the major ports where we have shipments come into, and then we also have um, as I mentioned, on a case-by-case on a -case basis, we also allow imports into other ports um, when, uh, you know, for, for infrequent shipments where we have field staff um, that may cover those or limited port staff that may cover those particular airports. So some of the additional things I wanted to talk about when it comes to imports is when you compare the United States to some of our other trading partners, um, we have minimal import regulations. Um, we only are regulating for two diseases, uh, spring viremia of carp and tilapia lake virus. And um, there's a lot of discussion as the aquaculture industry is growing and um, here in the U.S. about um, you know, adding additional import controls. So what kind of information do we need to think about before we do that and considerations? Um, and then also what is the process for creating those, those new regulations? So in general, there, these are kind of the big areas that we want to make sure we're thinking about um, before we move forward with creating federal import regulations. Um, we don't want to over-regulate, but we also want to make sure that we are doing our job to prevent disease introduction um, as much as possible. So the, the first one that I'll go through is the threat of introduction, so that's the, the orange circle up there. So there actually needs to be a threat. Um, usually, you know, it, it, just because there's a disease that's out there in some country, in some species, doesn't necessarily mean that the U.S. needs federal import regulations to protect ourselves from that disease. Um, there needs to be some sort of threat. So for tilapia, that's our most recent um, import regulation with tilapia lake virus. We do import tilapia um, susceptible life stages um, from countries that have had um, past cases or outbreaks of tilapia lake virus. So we had a threat of introduction in that case. Um, we also need to do a risk assessment. We need to look at the pathways for how that disease could move through the United States, could come into the United States, how it could move out of the United States. Um, we want to look at all of those different pathways to really understand and make sure that we're mitigating um, wherever we can with our import controls 
the, um, the introduction or the spread of that disease. We also want to look at our domestic movement restrictions. So in addition to the federal import requirements, there are also several states that have requirements for testing um, for different pathogens. It varies on a state-by-state -state basis. Um, there's also some states that have no regulations for aquatic animals. Um, and there's kind of, and, and um, so we need to look at that as well. It's not uniform across all of our states. Um, and it depends on, on their risk. Um, and so we need to look at what's happening domestically and then also look at the economic impact. So if we, what is the economic impact of a disease outbreak of a given pathogen here in the U.S.? How does that impact our aquaculture producers? How does that impact our natural resources? How does that impact um, you know, our, our seafood industry, all of, all of those things we need to think about. Also, diagnostic detection capabilities. So um, this is, you know, I sometimes think that this is kind of a given when we're talking about terrestrial diseases. But with aquatic animal diseases, we have so many that are emerging. Um, we have, you know, new tests that are being improved and developed. Um, and so we want to make sure that we actually have a way to be able to say that um, a group of animals is negative for a disease um, or, you know, and that we actually have an assay that will work and reliably work to tell us that. We want to look at disease surveillance. So what kind of disease surveillance are we doing domestically with our farms, but also, um, you know, have we done any wild um, aquatic animal surveillance for, for certain pathogens if we have susceptible species in the wild. Um, what are, and then the last area is export ramifications. So we, we need to be thinking about both um, sides of the coin. So sometimes having, restricting the animals that come into the United States improves and decreases the risk of introduction of, of disease into the United States. But then also, because of those import regulations, it improves the overall health status um, of animals here in the United States, which then also helps them on the export end when they want to send animals out of the U.S. Um, because we can say that we monitor and regulate um, spring viremia of carp, then we are decreasing our risk of that disease coming into the U.S. We're decreasing the risk of that disease um, then spreading within the U.S. and then we're, you know, then there's a decreased risk that the, that the animals that are leaving our country to go to other countries are going to spread that disease um, globally. We want to be thinking about all these different areas and, um, and then one last thing that we also need to think about is we are a member of the World Trade Organization. Um, and as a WTO member, we, um, we follow the sanitary and phytosanitary measures agreement, which, which basically um, is, outlines, um, you know, animal and product and plant um, trade negotiations and movement. Um, and so it's really important that we also consider that we, as a member of the WTO, we cannot impose import restrictions on our trading partners um, that we're not also meeting ourselves. So it, it, um, it, protects, it protects both parties. So um, that means that other countries should not be imposing import requirements um, on animals coming from the United States to their country, that they're not also meeting themselves. Um, and vice versa. This, um, it, there are sometimes situations, and, and some of you may be able to think of some off the top of your head, where um, you know that's not quite being met, and and um, and and in which case, you know, we can work with that trading partner to say, you know, this is a this is an unfair barrier to trade. But ultimately, we need to as a WTO member, be considering that and make sure that we're not just putting that stopgap at the entry into the U.S., but that we're also looking at how that disease is moving within our country. 
So if we decide to move forward with import regulations, um, then APHIS um, goes through a series of steps. And this is a very simplified um, process here. There's a lot more uh, details and, and nuances, um, but I wanted to highlight the overall process um, for those of you that aren't familiar with it. So if we say, okay, we want to, um, we want to create import regulations for a new pathogen, then it would be up to um, the live animal import staff, which, which I am on, um, to draft up what those, re what those import regulations would look like. Um, so we draft, draft up that proposed rule, um, and then we have our own internal approval processes where we, you know, share it internally. We have to, you know, move it through our chains of um, leadership for uh, review and approval. Um, and then once it has um, gone through our internal approval process, that proposed regulation is then published in what we call the Federal Register. So um, it's published in a public location where anybody can comment on it. Um, it's open for comment for a minimum of 60 days. Um, and then sometimes there's also uh, public hearings um, associated with, with that comment period. And that's an opportunity for anybody, any Anyone in the um, anyone involved or uh, any stakeholder that may be affected by these by these regulations, whether it's good or bad, um, they have an opportunity as a member of the public to comment and to provide um, background or um, you know support, dissent, whatever it may be. Once we receive those comments, um, we then review all of them and make any changes. Um, while considering the comments that we got back to the proposed rule. And then um, it is then, then once it's finalized, those regulations are then published in the Code of Federal Regulations, um, which are our uh, federal regulations that, um, um, that outline the requirements to bring that species and that, and that type of um, animal into the United States that, that have to be met, and that, that's, part, that's the law. Um, and then if we ever want to update those regulations in the code, um, we go through a similar set of processes um, to make any sort of amendment to, to um, a given area, whether it be to our equine regulations, to our fish regulations, um, what have you. So, that's a lot to, um, that's a lot I just kind of threw at you. And so there's a lot of considerations that we want to be thinking about before we move forward with import regulations, um, new import regulations. Uh, then there's the whole process of actually putting those, you know, taking that from that idea into law. Um, and so here are some of the things that I think as a, an industry, we can help um, support and, and that we should be thinking about. So um, because there's so many steps to the process, um, we need to, to start the organization process sooner rather than later. So getting all of our ducks in a row to even uh, be able to assess whether we need import regulations for a new pathogen. Um, also working on our, on our domestic surveillance um, we're doing that through a very through a variety of efforts, uh, both at the veterinary services level, but then also looking at a national level um, across across agencies. So, making sure that we have a better idea of what you know what is the health status of our country, of of the various regions within our country, um, and then um, you know looking at those those risk pathways to see if import controls um, can not only uh, support and protect our uh, domestic aquaculture industry, but also then anything that's leaving uh, our country. Another area is promoting immediate notification of disease detection. Um, because there are so many groups involved with aquatic animals in the U.S., whether it's um, agriculture, you know, aquaculture farming, whether it's natural resources, we have four different 
federal agencies involved. Then at the state level, sometimes aquaculture falls under the Department of Agriculture and the State Veterinarian's Office. Sometimes it falls under the Department of Natural Resources. Sometimes it falls under the Department of Marine Resources. So there's, there's a lot of stakeholders that are involved, and, um, and we are working to make sure that we all get on the same page and are reporting any immediate notifications because those affect not only our knowledge of the disease prevalence within the United States, but then also affects our ability to trade. Um, and then, you know, prioritizing that list of diseases. That can be difficult with aquatic animals because we have so many OIE-listed pathogens. We have, um, and, um, you know, we have so many emerging diseases that um, we can't always foresee. So making sure that we're, we're staying on top of that as well. So now we're going to um, talk a little bit about, we've talked about the requirements to leave the country, talked about requirements to come into the country, and now I just want to talk about transport in general. So safe aquatic animal transport, there's, you know, four big categories um, that I think of when I think about transport. So it's preparing the animals to actually travel, um, you know, before they're even packaged up. Then it's, you know, getting them prepared and packaging them for shipment. Then there's the actual movement um, itself, so going from one location to another location, and then unpacking at the other end. So for preparation, um, it will vary. It will vary between uh, the species that you're sending, the life stage that you're sending, um, and also, you know, the, the end use, right? So, you know, we'll... For the purposes of, of this discussion, we're talking live animals, um, so not, you know, not ones that were recently harvested that are going direct for human consumption, um, but, but let's think more for, you know, animals that are going for breeding or grow out or aquarium trade, something like that. Um, but know that, that it varies by, by species and sometimes end use. So one of the first uh, stages of the preparation process is isolating or figuring out which animals um, from the farm you're actually going to be shipping. Um, and so this picture here is of a um, shipping um, section of the farm where there's all of these blue uh, tanks that are turned over right now, but those are all used as holding tanks. So once they decide, you know, this batch of animals are, is what we want to send, um, those animals are often moved into this whole, these holding containers for a period of time before they're packaged up and shipped. Um, so in those separate holding containers, they're often um, taken off feed, so they're not fed for, for a few days. Um, again, that, that length of time will depend on the, on the species and life stage. And then sometimes also you'll hear the term purging um, or, um, you know, uh, various processes that basically um, help to kind of clean out the, the gut of the animals so that, um, you know, to, so that one, they're, you know, they're not defecating in the water for transport. Also, sometimes it has um, some effects, the purging process will have effects on the, um, the meat quality of the animal that's going. Um, so there, there's a variety of um, reasons for it, but essentially um, there's some sort of period where typically they're, they're not being fed, they're being held separate from the rest of the animals, and they're getting ready in that preparation um, process to be shipped. I also mentioned here that there's sometimes country-specific requirements of what that preparation needs to look like. So there are some countries that require those animals to stay, to stay in those holding containers for 30 days prior to export, or um, maybe they need to, um, you know, if we're talking about fertilized eggs, they need to be disinfected um, before they can be packaged up, or, you know, something along those lines. So, there are the normal steps that, that are often occurring when we move um, a certain type of aquatic animal um, in general, just 
just for the production model, but then there all may also be country-specific requirements that um, may need to be considered depending on where the animals are going. Okay, so now they have been prepared and um, we're going to package them up. Again, it will vary a little bit um, in, in the packaging, but I put a couple of pictures here to give you an idea. So um, in the, um, the left-hand picture, you see a cardboard box and then there's something, you know, inside of it that's um, like an insulated bag. Um, so you'll often see sort of a three-step um, three packaging process. So you'll see that on the outside you'll have a cardboard box. Then within that you'll have some sort of, um, you know, liner or um, insulation, depending on what the, the animal needs. And then within that you'll have the plastic bag um, and maybe double bags um, with the, the animal. And inside the plastic bag, you have water and you have oxygen. Um, so that's how they're packaged up. This this setup on the lower right hand side is 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 an, is an example of um, when the animals are getting ready to be filled up. Usually, the producers have a certain amount of water that they put into every bag, depending on the amount of animals that are going into that bag. Um, and then there's a certain amount of oxygen that's added um, as well. And then the plastic bags are closed up, they're put in those boxes. There's um, labeling that's required for international um, movement of live animals in general, but then there may also be additional labeling and packaging requirements for a, a given destination country that you may need to take into consideration. So once they're all packaged up, um, they're usually, the animals are usually packaged in such a way that um, they can last about 72 hours. Um, and so that's, you know, from the moment that you're, that you're closing that bag um, to the moment that the bag of animals is opened at the other end. Obviously, this will vary a little bit when we're talking about um, other species like larger aquatic uh, or like marine mammals, or um, you know, some of the some of the other um, aquar more aquarium type species that we have. So in general, um, they're packaged so that they can last about 72 hours, and then they're moved usually by plane as cargo. Um, sometimes they are, um, in the case of animals moving from across the land borders with Canada, um, they're put into trucks that are filled up with water. Um, and air stones, and they're moved that way. Um, but the majority are moved as cargo. And I have um, IATA here, um, which is our the International Airline Transportation Association, which has an entire live animal regulation section specific for aquatic animals. And they break it down by fish, um, whether it's small fish, large fish, um, you know, more of like your eel-type eel um, shaped fish, your crustaceans, your mollusks, um, your corals, your marine mammals. They have all sorts of different standards that um, for shipping these live aquatic animals that need to be met and are, and are agreed on as, a, as an international standard. We, um, APHIS does not have specific movement um, packaging requirements per se, um, but we do we we do contribute to and review the live animal regulations that IATA puts forth, and um, are are in regular communication with them so that we can ensure that the animals are moving safely. And then the last thing would be unpacking. So once they've gotten to the destination. Um, you know, those of you that have bought a fish at the pet store, this is you've probably seen and done something similar to this. But there's some sort of acclimation to the new environment that you're introducing that you're introducing the animals to. Um, in this case, the these fish are going into a new aquarium, so they're you know the the bag is being put in the water. They're they're getting used to the new temperature, um, and then at then once they've 
um, acclimatized, then they'll, you know, be let into the, the, new, the new environment. Um, in some cases, they will undergo a quarantine period um, before they enter the rest of the population, um, wherever their, their destination is. Um, and in some cases, there's disease testing upon arrival. Um, and so, again, these will all depend on the, um, on the environment and where they're going and the management processes. And, um, but in, in general, the, there's some sort of acclimatization process um, and then usually some sort of, you know, you want to make sure that the animals are um, looking healthy and um, you may or may not want to test. Um, for certain diseases, depending on um, the risk pathway. So, in summary, we talked a lot about um, import and export. I know that there, there's uh, this. You know, this is my bread and butter. This is what I do all the time. And there are a lot of technical details that go into. You know, if we really were to drill down into sending tilapia to Costa Rica, that I could, you know, spend many more hours talking about, um, you know, a certain species to a certain country. And like I said, I have a lot of resources if you if you have more specific questions. But in general, we talked about how there's four different agencies that have some involvement in the international movement of aquatic animals. In terms of USDA, um, the animals that we regulate leaving the country will depend on where they're going, and the animals that we regulate coming into the country will depend on the pathogen of concern. Where you find the best place to find resources are on our website. So for export, it's our IREG, it's our international regulations page, and then for import, we have our import website. And then for contacts, the best place to go for any questions about exporting animals internationally would be our endorsement offices, those four um, primary offices within the U.S., as well as if there's a, a local office that you typically work with for health certificate endorsement. And then for import, the main point of contact are going to be the ports because they're the first um, – they will be doing the veterinary inspection when the animals first enter the United States. Um, and are typically the ones that issue import permits and all that kind of stuff. And then with all of the import and export regulations, also keeping in mind that, you know, we are, for USDA, it is important that um, we not only are upholding the standards for the requirements to go to our trading, you know, for animals going to our trading partners, the requirements for animals coming in and protecting domestic aquaculture, um, from diseases, but also we are, um, you know, we we do have purview over that safe um, transiting and movement of animals and making sure that that's done um, in a safe manner. And so with that, um, I will take any questions. Okay. We do have a question. Um, could you provide a short listing of states that do have regulatory involvement concerning aquaculture? Sure. So, in general, um, the states that have requirements are typically the ones that have a lot of aquaculture or um, or natural resources that they are um, they want to protect domestically. So, it's going to be a lot of the um, you know, Maine, Florida, Washington State, Hawaii, um, a lot of those those states that um, that are, um, you know, that, that's an important industry to them, and they want to make sure that they're protecting the pathways into their state. Also, um, you know, up in the Great Lakes, um, where there's water being shared between multiple states, um, areas like that. I don't have a I can't list all of them off the top of my head, um, but primarily it's the ones that, you know, that have some sort of an aquaculture or natural resources um, industry that they're looking to protect within their state. Um, you, you don't find as many uh, regulations in some of the, the landlocked central states, um, and and as we see, that may change, however, you know, as we see aquaculture 
um, technology, allowing more and more land-based systems. Um, you know, we, we may have more industry in some of those um, states that have been more uh, that have been more terrestrial folks in their in their agriculture. Okay, so we do have a couple more questions. What are some specific reasons we choose to grow out in other countries? Sure. Um, so there are kind of two two big reasons that that um, come to mind. One is um, for for the overall industry, um, it's more it's more economical to do it that way. Um, you know, a lot of our species that we grow here in the United that we um, farm here in the United States, we it can be a very similar model to primary poultry breeders, where we have the genetics here. Um, and then we provide those, those breeding animals to other countries for them to then use in, in their grow out and it's less expensive for them to, whether it's grow those chickens or grow that shrimp um, or, um, you know, what have you in, in that, in another country and then we buy that product back. Um, so sometimes it's because, um, you know, it's cheaper to do it there, sometimes it's because we are, um, we've created a niche market here in the U.S. where we are that, that resource for the, the genetics and the breeding animals, um, and that's what we are sending to other countries for them to, to do the farming. And in some cases, the, the, the breeding animals are much more valuable um, than the, the individual animal that's going to be raised up to, to be eaten. So do we do inspections there to make sure our standards are equivalent? So the inspections that get done in other countries um, really depend on what um, what the end, you know, what the purpose of those animals are going to be for. So um, for example, uh, for goldfish coming into the United States, because we have import requirements, um, for SBC, they would be inspected in that originating country by a veterinarian, you know, overseen by the, the veterinary competent authority, the, whether it's, you know, the equivalent of USDA in that country. Um, and we would be looking at a lot of animal health requirements um, and have those expectations. For animals that are moving um, direct for human consumption, you know, those, those animals are are basically, if they're moving live, they're being moved and going directly into uh, a terminal market. So they're being slaughtered or they're being eaten. Um, and so the risk pathways are much less when it comes to how those can affect the animal health within our country or within, you know, if they're going the other direction within another country. Um, so more often, the, the animals that are going direct for human consumption, the seafood, so to speak, um, are being regulated by agencies that are looking for public health um, pathogens or um, standards of, of um, food processing and stuff like that. So um, it will depend on the on the reasoning for it. Um, we sometimes set up equivalency standards between countries where, you know, if we're sending you animals um, and you're sending us animals, we're both going to meet the same requirements on either end. Um, sometimes we travel to other countries to do audits of um, their their uh, inspection programs. Um, and vice versa, we have trading partners that come to the U.S. and look at our processes um, and standards. So um, it's a, the answer is yes. Um, it can always be improved. I feel like it's, you know, often changing. Um, and uh, it really kind of depends on what the purpose is of, for those animals and for raising those animals. The next question is, when those animals return to the U.S., will the label say the animals are domestic or grown internationally? Yeah, so um, 
in most cases, they will um, the the country if the sorry um, if the animal so let's say we we um, ship some some breeding animal to another country they um, go there and or you know they grow out animals they go there they're grown up they're processed they come back to the U S they're in that destination country for enough time typically that they're considered of origin of that country. Um, so coming back into our country, they would most likely say um, that they were, um, you know, from the from Thailand, from India, from um, from the United Kingdom, what have you. Okay. What is the required percentage of inspected bags of animals at the USDA port? And all animals need to be visualized? Yeah, so we have, um, you know, the, it will depend on the size of the shipment and also um, in some cases the, the relationship or the history that we have with that importer. Um, so if it is, the, the size of the shipment could really could really vary. We don't put a cap on how many animals um, could come in within a within a shipment. So, um, you know, somebody could decide to bring in 100,000 goldfish, and somebody else just wants to bring in two koi. Um, so it will it will depend on the on the size of the shipment. For the two koi, um, you know, they're probably going to come in in one maybe two boxes. Um, so essentially, that's Anything that's less, any shipment that's less than 10 boxes, we should be looking at all of the boxes. So opening them all up, looking at all the animals inside, um, and doing an inspection of 100% of, um, a visual inspection of 100% of, of the animals within that shipment. Um, if we have a shipment that's larger than 10 boxes, quite often we get them, you know, there, there, there are 20, 40, 60 boxes then we um, routinely, we, um, we randomly select about 10% of those and, and inspect just those boxes. If we, if after we've looked at 10% of that shipment and, you know, all the animals look healthy, all the paperwork's in order, we don't have any concerns about the shipment, um, then we, we would clear it based on, on that 10% inspection. We always have um, the, the, the authority to inspect the entire shipment if we are concerned about something. So if we're seeing dead animals, if um, the, the paperwork is not looking correct, um, you know, if the animals are looking just, you know, kind of sick and like they're alive but they, but they don't look that healthy. Um, if we've had um, problems with a particular importer where, um, you know, they will insert an animal that they're into, into you know, try and sneak animals into a bag that, um, that they're not supposed to um, import, uh, things like that. So we, we always have the authority to inspect the entire shipment, but typically um, for importers that um, are meeting the requirements, uh, we'll inspect about 10% of the box of the, the boxes, and as long as those are meeting all of our requirements and we don't have any concern, then we'll clear it based on that 10%. And the last question I have right now in the chat is: I can recall a previous use of the Lacey Act to prevent injurious disease introduction to wildlife. Is this type of regulation used with aquaculture, thinking for emerging diseases? So I, um, the Lacey Act, um, I, and I'll defer to Kathleen if she has anything to add to this, um, you know, is, is when it comes to live animals, live aquatic animals, it's primarily um, regulations that fish and wildlife have, um, and most of their regulations are looking at, you know, protections to, um, to our wild populations here in the U.S. Um, they they do have regulations on aquatic animals coming into the U.S. Um, you know some 
some of the farm species that they will look at um, are, you know, a lot of the aquarium um, species, species that are used in the aquarium and the pet trade. Um, and then they also are looking at um, salmonids. So for the salmonid species, they have a variety of, excuse me, of pathogens that they require testing for um, and additional health requirements um, for salmonids to bring to bring those into the United States. Um, I know there's been some talk about expanding those, expanding the, the regulations under the Lacey Act, but I'm not sure that anything has changed at this point. Um, Kathleen, is there anything else you want to want to add to answering that question? Sure. Thanks, Alicia. Hey, everybody. Uh, yes. Yeah, so aquaculture has gotten tripped up and involved in the Lacey Act and in, I guess within the past 10 years, there have been instances where aquaculture has been found in violation of the Lacey Act with regards to interstate movement of um, injurious species. And of course, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife definition of injurious species is sometimes um, a little different or one-off. Um, they include in there, of course, species that may carry um, pathogens that they consider injurious, as well as being um, a non-native species. So, for example, the two lawsuits within the last couple of years that I'm aware of were with regards to um, the finding of tadpoles or frogs in, like, the fish trucks or fish wagons that are being used to move these animals that are collect farm-raised animals that are collected out of ponds, those types of things. And, of course, the interpretation and application that it, you, the farmer didn't even have to be found um, willing to, you know, it wasn't intentional. Obviously, when you're catching up these animals out of the ponds, you get tons of um, hitchhikers, if you will, um, including frogs and tadpoles and that kind of thing. And so there was a lawsuit against U.S. Fish and Wildlife, and then um, subsequent to that, uh, and it was actually a federal violation, so the farm, I think, ended up having um, in lawsuits and fees, it was around a $50,000 price tag to fight U.S. Fish and Wildlife on that. Uh, and then with regards to the chytrid fungus, both in the frogs and in the salmonids, uh, because of how U.S. Fish and Wildlife was approaching that, the courts found that the way the Lacey Act was being interpreted, giving U.S. Fish and Wildlife the authority to regulate the interstate movement of our aquatic animals was not a legal interpretation of that. Um, so they have, U.S. Fish and Wildlife has backed off recently from using the Lacey Act to, um, you know, regulate the interstate movement, um, although, as Alicia said, they are working on updating or modernizing the Lacey Act, which our aquaculture industry is watching very carefully. What we don't want to have happen, of course, is them to expand their list of pathogens um, to include, to be considered invasive species, those types of things, which would be really, it would catch aquaculture in a really difficult position to be able to move aquatics interstate. So, um, yeah, the Lacey issue is a huge issue for our domestic industry, um, and we would like to see um, you know, import controls fall under USDA authority. Uh, right now, you know, as Alicia mentioned in Title 50, which is where they've got the health controls for salmonid species entering into this country, those were written back in the 60s and 70s before we had ISA, which is infectious salmon anemia, or SAV, which is the salmonid alpha virus. And so, you know, Title 50 isn't even really catching the more important um, OIE-listed salmonid diseases um, just because it's become so outdated. But, of course, our 
um, resource colleagues are in a conundrum because if they open it up, they will, for updating, uh, they will obviously get a lot of um, pushback about, you know, removing some of that language in there. And uh, so they're trying to figure out how to update that language without having to redo the whole thing. Anyway, long story. Happy to take any questions if they've come up. Thanks, Kathleen. All right. Does, does anyone else want to put a question in the chat? Okay. If we have no other questions for the people that are on the line, we'll be sending out I'll be sending out the um, the fourth uh, webinar series information this afternoon. Um, and so I will bid you all a great afternoon, and uh, we'll be back online on Tuesday, October 6th at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Thanks for all your participation. Thanks, everyone. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect. <laughs>